Well, let's begin tonight by reading a passage of scripture. I want to read Psalm 119, two verses from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verses 159 and 160, and then pray and open up our time together. This is what scripture says, Psalm 119, verses 159 and 160. It says, consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity to dig a little deeper into your word tonight and to understand how your Bible is true, how your words are true, and how we can have great confidence in the truthfulness of your word. We can stake our life on it. We can stake our eternal life on it. And we can be all the more excited to share the truth of this message with our unbelieving neighbors, friends, family, and coworkers. I pray, Father, for the people of God in this room hearing this message tonight would be built up in their faith and more excited to defend it against attacks to the Bible. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Maybe you've heard this statement before. I don't trust the Bible because of all the errors in the Bible. I've run into people who have said that to me. And in fact, when they said that to me, they stated almost like it's axiomatic. It's a fact. Don't you know? The Bible just has a lot of errors. Because the Bible has a lot of errors, therefore, you can't trust the Bible. So I've kind of developed a stock response. You know, when you run into someone and they say, oh, can't trust the Bible. It's got all these errors. Well, the first thing I say is, oh, really? Uh, which ones? Just ask them to show you. Now, a lot of Christians don't know their way around the Bible very well. And unbelievers, even more so, can't find chapter and verse or even name a precise contradiction. So I think that's a great first step. Oh, really? Which ones? Can you show me? And just see what they say. And I think that's probably going to work like 90% of the time. So we don't even need to have the rest of this lesson for most of the people you're going to talk to. You already got your answer. Oh, yeah, which ones? And they have nothing to say. But that's not going to work all the time. And in fact, you might run into some people that actually know something and say, oh, well, let me show you a couple. And then all of a sudden, you're, oh, whoops, <laughs> what, what did I step into? What, what, what door did I open up that I didn't mean to walk through? And in which case, you have to be ready and know how to respond to these supposed errors. One person, I mentioned his name last week in reference to someone who challenged the Bible, is a, a man named Bart Ehrman. And uh, he's someone that if you ran into him or someone who's been taught by him and he's taught thousands of people, and millions of people have read his books. His books have been on New York Times bestseller list. Well, if they've read some of those books, then they might have a few chapters and verses to point to that are claimed to be errors in the Bible, and you need to know how to respond. I want to read to you one of the kind of errors as an example of how he described how these errors actually led to his loss of faith in the trustworthiness of the Bible. It's kind of a long quote, but it's a, it's a bit of a... Um, autobiography for him about why he lost his faith. And so I just want to read this to you. He says this right in the beginning of one of his most popular books. And I think it'll give you a window in the way he thinks. So follow along as I read this. He writes, when I was in seminary, I was taking a class devoted to the interpretation of the gospel of Mark. At that time, I would have called myself a strong evangelical Christian. I thought the Bible had no mistakes. The first time I realized it did was Mark chapter 2. The disciples are walking through a grain field of Jesus, and the Pharisees object to them eating grain because it's the Sabbath. Jesus asks them if they haven't read the passage in Scripture when David went into the temple of God and ate showbread that wasn't supposed to be eaten. He says it happened when Abathar, Abiathar, was the high priest. So for the term paper, I decided to write on this passage. It contains a famous historical problem because the book of Samuel says that Abiathar was not the high priest at that time. It was his father, Ahimelech. I wrote a 35-page paper examining why this can't be a mistake. It was based on the interpretation of the Greek words. The grammar's tricky in this passage. My professor was a very devout Christian who I respected very much. He gave me an A on the paper, but at the end, he wrote, well, maybe Mark just made a mistake. Even though it was a tiny little detail, it exploded the whole thing for me. 
Once I realized there could be a mistake in the Bible, I started finding them all over the place. He says, the first thing it did was made me realize the Bible is not an inerrant revelation from God. It's a human book with errors. I stopped being an evangelical and became a liberal Christian. I eventually became an agnostic. There's no way I would have leaped from fundamentalist to agnostic. It required a lot of transition, and the first thing to go was the inerrancy of the Bible. So for him, it was finding this one little error in the Bible that unraveled the whole trustworthiness of the Bible for him. Because here's the thing. There's a certain logic to this. If you can find even one small little error in the Bible, well, then the Bible can err. And how do you know there's not more? And more so, how do you know which ones are errors, which ones aren't? How do you even go about adjudicating what's true and what's not? Well, then you're up to you to decide. And you can't trust the whole thing. So either the Bible is completely error-free and trustworthy, or it really can't be trusted at all. Some people try to walk some middle line, but there is no middle line. Either the Bible is trustworthy and true or not. So how would you respond to Bart Ehrman if you ran into him or, or ran into someone who read one of his New York Times bestsellers and told you about this exact example, which is in the introduction? What would you say? He points to an alleged specific error. There's a contradiction in the Bible. Samuel says Ahimelech was the high priest, but Mark says Abiathar was the high priest. Well, which was it? Is Samuel right or is Mark right? They can't both be right. Is one of them erring? How do we know? So how do we sort that out? How would you respond? Who's right? Is Bart Ehrman right? Are there mistakes all over the place? What would you say? And his testimony is not the only one. It's just representative. A lot of other people part to, will point to all kinds of, of uh, problems in the Bible. They'll point to errors related to things like science, scientific errors in the Bible. It just can't comport with what we know from modern science. It was written pre-modern pre ages before people know what we know today. So clearly it's, it's full of errors from what we know today. Or there's historical errors from archaeology or from uh, other evidence we have, knowledge of history, other ancient writers, they contradict what the Bible says. So the Bible must be an error. Or there's internal contradictions like the one I just pointed to. It's like, well, one book says one thing, another book says something else, another author says something else. So clearly there's a contradiction. Well, which is it? You fundamentalist Christians say the whole Bible is true. <laughs> it's so silly, you're not even reading your own Bible. There's internal contradictions within the Bible itself. That's what they would point to. So what do we say? And there's other ones too. You know, we talked about uh, Abiathar or Elimelech as high priest, but what about Judas? That's the one I ran into. I was a just starting seminary and I was waitering at a restaurant and I ran into some university student at the University of Louisville. And, um, you know, I was about to go to, I was starting seminary. I actually hadn't even started my first class yet. I was, it was in the summer leading up to it. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm learning the Bible. I ran into some guy, and he's like, hey, well, how did Judas die? I'm like, well, what do you mean, how did Judas die? He's like, well, he's like, well, one writer says he hung himself. Another writer says that he, um, his uh, innards fell out when he, when he fell on the ground. So which one was it? I'm like, oh. Uh, and he kind of stumped me. I hadn't run into that one before. I didn't know what to say. So who's right? Is Acts right, or is Luke right in the book of Acts, or is Matthew right? They both give a different account for how Judas died. Well, what do we say to that? Are there errors in the Bible? This presents, uh, uh, these attacks present a specific dilemma in our quest to establish the truthfulness of the Bible. So I want to just unpack a little more of this dilemma of what exactly is the dilemma we have around asserting the inerrancy of the Bible. And then also talk about how we can defend the inerrancy of the Bible as Christians. So let's look at that together. So first, is the Bible an inerrant? That is the dilemma. Do we actually want to claim that as Christians? Is that what we're actually claiming? The Bible is completely without error. Well, let's define what we mean by inerrancy. 
here's a couple definitions. What do we actually claim? Because sometimes, sometimes the problem we run into is because we're claiming something that we shouldn't claim. So we need to be nuanced in what we're actually asserting about the claim of inerrancy. So here's what inerrancy means. There's a couple definitions. This one's from Rob Plummer, author and seminary professor and New Testament scholar. He says, the Bible is completely truthful in all things that the biblical authors assert, whether in geographic, chronological, or theological details. That's really important. He's saying the Bible is true, not just in its doctrine, but even in historical and geographical matters chronological issues, all things that it touches on that it asserts as true are without error. There's another simple definition. This is from Wayne Grudem in his Systematic Theology, a very popular work. He says, Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. So it's another qualification. He's saying that inerrancy applies in the original manuscripts. So we, what we might have today might not match what was originally written. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. We talk about the transmission of Scripture. I think that's week number five, so stay tuned for that. Make sure you keep, keep you come, wanting to come back, right? But uh, here's two definitions that are helpful. So, but if we're going to summarize very simply, we're simply saying that this doctrine of inerrancy means when the Bible indicates that something is true, you can trust that it's true. When the Bible says something is true, you can believe that it is, in fact, true. It's so simple, right? But we're just clarifying what we mean. And so the Bible claims this about itself, right? Think of some verses. Psalm 12, 6. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. God's words are flawless. They don't have any errors. That's what Psalm 12, 6 says. Or John 10, 35. The scripture cannot be broken. In the context, he's saying everything that asserts is true. If the Bible says something, it can't be established to be false. It can't be broken. The promises of scripture are trustworthy. This is a very basic and straightforward claim. But when we start to look at how this applies to the Bible, it can get a little more complex. I mean, think about it. Right now, in our Bible reading plan, if you're following along with the First Baptist Bible reading plan, we're reading the book of Job. Well, there's chapters and chapters and chapters in the book of Job, most of the middle of the book, where Job's friends are the ones speaking to Job. And the truth is, a lot of the things, a lot of the advice the friends are giving is not good advice. It's not true advice. They're actually saying things that are inaccurate about God and the world. So does that, does that mean does that mean that part of Scripture is not, not, in, is not inerrant? Is it, it's an error? Well, no. No, because we have to read it according to the context and the literature. If you read it in context, actually the scripture says that Job's friends spoke what was wrong. The scripture is not trying to report that it's true. It's reporting what they said. So again, some people can misunderstand. Oh, look, that's an error in the Bible. No, that's just a simple not recognizing the context. So God condemns Job's friends as not true words. But what, so that's what inerrancy does mean. But what does inerrancy not mean? Just to clarify a little more precisely, what does inerrancy not mean? Well, I want to give you four things that we do not mean when we say the Bible is inerrant. We don't mean that Scripture has to conform to our modern conventions of accuracy. Scripture has to conform to our modern conventions of accuracy. Here's just one, one brief example. If you look in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 1, it says, In the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then he's got a quote, and, but he quotes two different prophets, but the first prophet he quotes is actually Malachi, not Isaiah. He doesn't even mention Malachi. Does that mean he was in error? He quoted the wrong prophet? Why, why didn't he say what, I, what, what Malachi the prophet said? Why did he say Isaiah? Well, again, if you're writing a college paper and you're trying to follow, you know, Turabian or Chicago Manual style and how you're supposed to cite your sources and all that, well, then, yeah, this wouldn't fit that Chicago Manual style. But that's not the rules they played by. They was, 
Devin, there's a lot of reasons why Mark could have done this. One of the reasons is simply because Isaiah was the bigger, more well-known prophet. He mentions his name, and then he finishes with Isaiah. He does quote Isaiah, and he's showing how Malachi and Isaiah fit together. We have to understand what Mark is doing and why Mark did that, and not assume it's an error just because it doesn't conform to our standards. The gospel writers aren't uniform in how they report the sequences of events in the life of Jesus. You know, if you were going to read a modern news article, maybe about something in the war in Israel, you'd expect it to be really precisely laid out chronologically, right? Well, that's not how the Gospels are written. The Gospels are not arranged strictly chronologically. They're actually organized topically or thematically or theologically. And that's according to the conventions of their day and the genre of their writing. So we can't force the Bible to fit our standards of writing. That's not how they work. So that's the first thing inerrancy does not mean. Another thing that inerrancy does not mean that narratives or speeches must be relayed exhaustively. Exhaustively. So again, think about the gospel narratives around the crucifixion of Jesus. So for instance, Matthew and Mark include that Jesus was scourged, he was whipped and mocked, but Luke doesn't include that. As also, as Jesus was walking to the place of his crucifixion, Luke includes details about a large crowd following him, including women who were mourning and lamenting. Matthew and Mark don't include this detail. Luke also includes Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, while Matthew and Mark don't include this. Or even more significantly, Matthew and Mark say that there are two criminals being crucified of Jesus who are both mocking him. But when you read Luke, Luke only reports that one criminal was mocking him, and the other one rebuked the mocker and asked Jesus to remember him when he went into his kingdom. Does that mean they're contradictory? No, because each writer is not required to represent everything that happened exhaustively. They're not contradictory, they're complementary. That's how we need to understand them. They're not errors, they're just deciding for their reasons, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to include the facts they wanted to include and not include other facts. But when you put them all together, they can be harmonized. They're not contradicting each other. So Luke doesn't include the scourging and mocking, but that doesn't mean it, he's not claiming it didn't happen. He just didn't include it. Or Matthew and Mark didn't include some of the speeches that Jesus makes, but Luke uh, they do include. They don't include it, but Luke does. It doesn't mean he's denying those things. They're denying those things. They're just not framed according to what they're trying. The story they're trying to tell, or Luke, right? Well, when you put it together, there was two criminals. They were both mocking, but one of them, somewhere along the three hours they were hanging there together, saw that Jesus really was who he claimed to be and stopped mocking and asked Jesus to remember him. Luke just didn't include the first part of that story. It doesn't mean he didn't believe it or didn't know about it. It just wasn't what he recorded in his gospel. So demanding that every gospel tell the same story, well, then why do you need three gospels or four gospels? They're complementary, not contradictory, when you put them all together. So thirdly, inerrancy does not mean that Scripture must conform to the languages and conventions of modern science. So for instance, right, Psalm 19.6 clearly says that the sun rises from one horizon and it travels across the sky throughout the day and then it sets beyond the other horizon. So now if you were going to take an astronomy test tomorrow and you wrote down that description that you got from Psalm 19 as the answer for how the sun or the earth revolve, you would get a wrong answer. You would fail that test because your astronomy test is trying to ask for an accurate scientific answer, but the psalmist is not trying to do that. He, he's, he's not trying to describe the sun as a mobile celestial body that rises and sets and travels across the sky. David's writing simply from his perspective. He's describing the phenomena as he sees it. We do the same thing. We talk about the sun setting. Well, again, if you talked about the sun moving around the earth on an astronomy test, it'd be wrong. But the Bible is not trying to give an accurate scientific answer in that case. It's just describing from our perspective. And we do the same thing all the time in our casual speech. It's using poetic language for a different point. So forcing the Bible to fit a standard that it wasn't aiming to meet 
is going to force you to see errors that aren't there because it's not what's intended. So thirdly, inerrancy does not mean inerrancy does not mean that everything in the Bible is true. Let me explain what I mean. It means that when the Bible indicates that something is true, you can trust that it's true. So for instance, real simple example. Psalm 14.1 says, there is no God. Now, of course, this is David describing the heart of the fool, because then he says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Or in Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent comes and is trying to deceive Eve, he, he tells a lie. You, you will not surely die if you eat of the fruit. Well, it's a lie. The Bible tells us it's a lie. So just because it records that lie accurately doesn't mean it's saying those words are true. Again, they have to be read in context. So forcing the Bible to mean something it doesn't intend to mean is going to allow you to see errors that actually, actually aren't there. So again, reading it in context is important. So all this to say, when it comes to the doctrine of inerrancy, we have to understand what the Bible claims to be true is true. So how do we defend it against the kind of attacks, though, we've seen so far? Some of the ones I read in the beginning from Bart Ehrman or some of the other ones I mentioned, science or history or whatever. How do we go about actually proving or making arguments for the doctrine of inerrancy? We clarify what it, doesn't, what it does mean, clarify what it doesn't mean, but how do we actually go about establishing it? How do we go about proving it? Okay, so I want to do that in two steps, two different kinds of argument. One, offensive, arguing for the doctrine, and one, negative. How do we argue the other way? So there's different ways that we can think about the doctrine of inerrancy. One is to simply follow up what we talked about last time. Last time. We talked last week about the doctrine of inspiration. Doctrine of inspiration. So we talked about how the Bible isn't just a human book. It is a human book, but as Christians, we believe the Bible is more than just a human book. We don't want to say it's less than that, but we want to say it's more than that. The Bible is both a divine and a human book. It's the word of men. Men wrote the word of God, but they did it as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We looked at 2 Peter 1, 21. We also looked at 2 Timothy 3, 16, how the all scripture is inspired by God. It's God's very breath. It's breathed out by God. So the Bible itself is God's very word because it's breathed out by him. So then it follows, if the Bible really is inspired, right? This is the thing about it. For, just, let, just let this very simple equation. If the Bible comes from God, then... If God is true, his word is true. If God is true, his word is true. So, does God lie? The doctrine of inspiration is the foundation for our doctrine of inspiration. So think of a verse like Numbers 23, 19. It says that God is not a man that he should lie. When God speaks, he does not lie. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said and he will not do, or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it. Or Titus 1.2. Titus 1.2 says God never lies. God never lies. Or a verse like Hebrews 6.18. It's actually impossible for God to lie. It's not just that he doesn't do it. He can't lie. It's against his nature. It's an undermining of the divine essence of who God is himself. He's righteous, he's holy, he's perfect, and he's true. Because God is true, when he speaks, it is true. And the Bible is God's word. So if God is true, and he has spoken, and his words are true, and God's words are contained in the Bible, this is God's word, then this word, this written word, the Bible, is true. That's a simple logical deduction, but it works. And it works because God always speaks the truth. Think about the verse we just looked at. It says, has he said and, has, and, and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Or Isaiah 45, 19. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. 
or John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The Bible over and over again wants us to know because God is true and because God has spoken, his words are true. So everything we said last week, we spent a whole hour talking about the doctrine of inspiration. Because God inspired the Bible, because it's his words and he is true, his word is true. So that's the most positive thing we can say to argue for the doctrine of inspiration. God doesn't lie, so his word doesn't lie. This is an offensive argument. It's the foundation for how we can establish inerrancy. But here's the reality. That's good and right and true, and that's where you start when you're talking to people about inerrancy. But when you're talking to your friends, neighbors, coworkers, and they're skeptical already about the Bible, for you to make a theological argument is probably not going to be most convincing. It's a good starting spot. It shows consistency, but they want to talk about details. They want to point to specific test cases. Well, look at this. Well, look at this. Look at this. That's what happened to Bart Ehrman. A theological argument wasn't going to convince him because he's like, well, that's nice and good, but I'm seeing it in the text itself. There's problems. There's inconsistencies. There's contradictions. There's errors. That's why most people claim to not believe in inerrancy. So what do we say to them? We talked about the offensive argument for inerrancy from the doctrine of inspiration, but how do we defend against these errors? When you run into people who bring these challenges to the Bible, how do we argue against specific challenges? When they say, well, what about the scientific errors? What about historical errors? What about internal errors? Now, in the short time we have tonight, we can't look at every single alleged error in the Bible, but I want to look at a couple key ones, some big ones, some famous ones, and I think what you'll see as we go through them, it kind of gives you a model for how to resolve them. The way we walk through these examples are test cases, and you can apply the same principle to other alleged errors when you run into them. Does that make sense? All right, so let's look at a couple together. Let's just walk through these together. So people claim that the Bible is not true because it contains scientific errors. So does the Bible contain scientific errors? Well, think about what we just looked at a second ago, right? It says that Psalm 19.6 says the sun rises and sets. It's a scientific error because the sun is stationary. The earth orbits around it and spins on its axis. So that's so that it looks like the sun rises and sets. And then another verse, Psalm 96.10, says the, wor the world is established. It shall never be moved. Well, doesn't the psalm know that the earth is always moving and it orbits the sun and it turns on its axis? I mean, if you're just taking those statements kind of on face value and trying to read them through the lens of a scientific grid, a modern scientific grid, you're going to say the Bible got it, got it, has it exactly backwards. It claims that the sun is moving and the earth is stationary, when we know from our study of modern astronomy that it's actually the other way around. The Bible's got it backwards. It's the sun that's still and the earth that's moving all the time. So, scientific error. Can't trust the Bible. Well, again, it's a twofold response. We kind of talked about this already but it's asking the Bible to do something it's not meant to do. It's evaluating by the standards of modern science. And if you were, to be clear, to be clear, if you were to evaluate those two Psalms by the standards of modern science, then they would be errors. If that was a correct way to evaluate them. They are saying things that are backwards from what we know from modern astronomy are accurate. But... But we're not taking an astronomy test when we're reading the Bible. The Bible is not attempting to subject itself to the standards of modern science. It's merely describing the world as they see it. We, we use the term, I don't know if I said this already, phenomenological language. It's, it's evaluating the phenomena as it appears. It's what it looks like. We see it that way. But it's not trying to give a scientific evaluation of it. And I think, I think, this is what happens all the time when people are trying to evaluate it by science. Same thing when they talk about Genesis or the flood 
or lots of other things that people want to point to. They're not recognizing what the Bible means by these things and evaluating by how they appear. We, could, we had a whole midweek course on creation, evolution, and the flood. We can't get into all that tonight, but I just want to say that there's good scientific reasons and evidence for why Christians believe what the Bible says is true. And we don't need to evaluate it through the lens of evolution. But it's helpful for us to remember, even as we're doing that, the Bible was not written as a science manual. A lot of Christians get into trouble because they want to force the words of Scripture to answer questions that they weren't intended to ask. So we don't go to the Bible to answer all of our scientific questions, but when it touches on things that intersect with science, we can believe it's true. But it's not a comprehensive manual for that. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go to another one. This is a, maybe more interesting for a lot of us. Does the Bible contain historical errors? Historical errors. There's lots of things people point to as examples of historical errors. So here, here's, here's a famous one from Luke chapter 2, right? We know Luke 2 when, uh, here, I'll, I'll read these first two verses. We always read these around Christmas time. Maybe you read these on Christmas morning. My family always reads Luke 2. It says in Luke 2, verses 1 and 2, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Okay, so in this passage, the reason that Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem to have baby Jesus in the manger is because there was a census by Quirinius, right? That's what it says. Well, the contradiction, alleged contradiction comes in because there's an ancient Roman historian that we rely on a lot for all kinds of information from around the Bible times named Josephus. And he tells us that Quirinius was the governor of Syria in 6 AD. Well, the problem is we think this probably happened around 4 BC. So we're off by about 10 years. And it's before that. So either Josephus is right or the Bible is right. That's what, that's an alleged historical error. Maybe Luke just got it wrong. Josephus was a very careful story. He actually became the historian of the emperor of the Roman Empire, and his written volumes and volumes of his history that we rely on for all kinds of information for the ancient world. So it looks like Luke made an error. Is this because Luke did not sufficiently brush up on his history before he went ahead and wrote these verses? It's a problem because the reason Joseph even brings Mary in the first place is because of the census. And if the census didn't happen until 10 years later, then there's actually no reason for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. Did he just manufacture that just to make it fulfill prophecy that actually didn't actually happen in real time? Luke just made all this up? There's actually no reason for them to even be in Bethlehem without this census. That history outside the Bible tells us didn't happen until 6 AD. So how do we put all that together? Well, there's a lot of different ways to figure this out. And this is what I want to say here. When it comes to some of these alleged historical errors, a lot of times we can't say precisely this is what happened. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Our job is just to show there's no necessary contradiction. Is there some plausible explanations? Do we have to conclude that it's an error? Or is there other ways of explaining it? So here's some examples. One explanation is that we can look at the grammar of Luke chapter 2. Many Greek scholars have argued that the word translated first, right? It says uh, this was the first registration. when And they say, well, it could also be translated before. So in which case, Luke could actually be saying that the census occurred before Quirinius was governor. That's one way to make it match up historically. Or another explanation is from archaeology. There's been uh, unearthed this, what, what's called by archaeologists, the Trivoli tombstone, and it contains evidence that some Roman governors actually served multiple terms. So it's possible that Quirinius was governor at the time of Jesus' birth, and then he became governor again in 6 AD. I mean, we might have that situation for the president, maybe, right? 
different terms with gaps in between. Maybe that's what happened with Quirinius. Maybe he was governor during the census in 4 or 5 BC, and he was governor again later in 6 AD, and that's the only one that Josephus is talking about. That's possible. Another explanation was that Quirinius wasn't the official governor at the time of Jesus' birth, but he served in some other governing role. So the Luke's description of him as a governor is still accurate. He's just speaking more colloquially, or Josephus is speaking more technically. It's another way to resolve it. You know, perhaps the best explanation is simply to say that the census began under an earlier governor, but what the project was actually brought to completion several years later under Quirinius, but he got the credit for it. I mean, just think about how long it takes for government projects to get done. Think about how long it takes for us to just build a playground. Right? Sometimes things just take a while. So the census got started, but it didn't get completed. Or, or what are people going to say 20 years from now about who gets credit whether you like it or not, right? But who gets credit for the COVID vaccine? Well, it started under Trump, but really was implemented under Biden. So who gets, so 20 years now, are they gonna talk about Trump with the vaccine or Biden? Well, it kind of depends. One initiated it, one completed it, you could say. I'm not trying to weigh into the politics of the vaccine here. I'm just using it as an example. So with the census, so maybe someone else started and Quirinius it finished underneath him and he just, Luke's just summarizing this years later. Remember, Luke wrote this decades later. Decades later. So when people look decades earlier, who are they going to give credit to? That's another way to resolve this challenge. We don't always know the exact way to say, well, this is exactly what happened. We don't, we don't have comprehensive knowledge of the ancient world. We have bits and pieces of data. We have the Bible. We have stuff outside the Bible. And if there is actually a contradiction, where well, I'm going to go with the Bible. But I'm also going to say, is there other ways of explaining it that don't have to assume there's a contradiction? And is there a good reason to think that? And so that's one of the ways we can resolve it. Or, but, but there's lots of times that people have alleged challenges of the Bible because we didn't know information that later was resolved. Like I just said, let me just give you another example. We, we don't know the ancient world comprehensively. Right? I mean, we don't, we don't know a lot of things about what happened before us. We only know what was recorded. And even then, we only know what we have records of today. And a lot of times, we don't even have a, a way of evaluating the evidence of that, because we might only have one witness, not multiple witnesses. It's hard to know. So, we need not assume that we have enough information to even prove that it's, inaccurate, that, that it's accurate. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, it mentions a king of Assyria named Sargon. And for centuries and centuries, people who did not believe the Bible or critics of the Bible pointed to that. And they said, look, we have no record. We have, we have records of all these other Assyrian kings from the ancient world. No record at all of this guy Sargon. It's just an example of the Bible getting it wrong. The Bible's got an error. It mentions guys that didn't actually exist in history. We have all these records. He's not one of them. So obviously the Bible is an error. Well, that was the argument some made until 1867, when a Sir Henry Rollers, Rollinson discovered an ancient inscription with King Sargon's name on it that proved his existence and supported what the Bible had already claimed about him. Now, we, if, if you lived before 1867 and someone challenged you about Sargon, you couldn't point to anything. We didn't have any evidence from history. It existed. It was in the ground. We just didn't know it was there until it was unearthed. So sometimes we have to suspend judgment and say, I don't know, but when all the facts are known, the Bible will be proved true. But we don't have all the facts yet. Here's another famous example that also proves this. When you read in the Bible about the uh, Hittites, you know, you're mentioned back in Genesis, uh, with the listing of all the people that were in Canaan. Hittites are one of the people groups. They're mentioned some 50 times in the Bible. Even uh, the famous story of David and Bathsheba, right? Uriah the Hittite. So the Bible talks about these people group, the Hittites, all over the place in the Old Testament. Well, and the Bi critics mocked the Bible for this for centuries because we had no record whatsoever outside of the Bible of this people group that were expansive in the Bible. They, they, ex they exist through multiple centuries of the Bible, and there's no record of them at all outside the Bible. Huh. 
Another example, the Bible talks about these people called the, the what are they called? The, the, the Hittites? Yeah, yeah, they didn't exist. Psst, silly Christians believe in this stuff. That's what people said, and they alleged it. And you know what? For centuries, Christians just said, well, they were true. We believe they're true, and maybe someday we'll have some evidence to prove it. So for centuries, Christians couldn't point to something in history to resolve that tension, but they believed the Bible was true. But when all the facts are known, it proves the Bible is true. And so that's what a lot of people thought until a German archaeologist and linguist named Hugo Winkler, he got wind of some ancient clay tablets that were discovered by local looters in a small modern-day town in Turkey. And he organized a series of excavations from 1906 to 1912. And first, he unearthed five temples, a fortified tower, and numerous sculptures. And he figured out, this is talking about the Hittites. And he's like, look, look, we got evidence. The Bible is true. They're, they talk about the Hittites. And skeptics were still skeptical. Okay, all right, well, fine. Maybe, maybe there were some people called the Hittites. But you just found this small little evidence in one little area. My goodness, when you read the Bible, there exists all this massive land area and over multiple centuries. So even if the Bible is right in talking about the Hittites, they weren't the same type of description that we have in the Bible. So the Bible's still wrong. Well, he kept digging. And then he found a jackpot, a royal archive room with over 10,000 ancient clay tablets. And they were finally deciphered in 1915, and they, it was actually determined that the city they were found in was actually the ancient capital city of Hattusha. It was the capital of the Hittite Empire. And in these clay tablets, they had extensive historical records over hundreds of years of the Assyrian Empire, of the Hittite Empire, and the land they owned and conquered. And they even were able to publish a grammar, a Hittite grammar in 1917 based on all these tablets. And they didn't even know this people group even existed. And now we have a grammar of their language. This civilization was lost and it was rediscovered, but the Bible had it right all along. So archaeology, when all the facts are known, will support the Bible. But we don't always have all the facts all the time. So there might be some tensions we have in trying to prove everything is accurate, but we believe the Bible is God's word, and from all the evidence we do have, it only supports the truthfulness of the Bible and doesn't contradict it. Doesn't contradict it. All right, lastly, what about these internal errors? That's kind of where we started. We started today with the story of Bart Ehrman. I mentioned my friend at the restaurant I worked at as a waiter, talked about the Judas's death. So how do we make sense of that? How do we explain these internal errors of the Bible? We don't, we're not waiting on archaeology or science to explain all this. So what do we say? We mentioned two, right? We talked about, is Ahimelech the high priest during David's reign, as Samuel says? Or is Abiathar the actual high priest? What do we say about this? And Judas, did he die by hanging himself, as Matthew says in Matthew 27, 5? Or did Judas die by falling headlong and his innards fell out, as Luke indicates in Acts 1, 18? How do we put these verses together? So, similar to what I just said, we don't always have to give the exact thing that we know happened. We just have to show that it's not intention. There's a plausible explanation to show how they're complementary and not contradictory. And so, what do we say to explain these tensions in the text? Well, in the case of Samuel and Mark, is Samuel right or is Mark right? Is it Ahimelech or Abiathar? That's the high priest. Who got it right? Well, I think there's a simple explanation. Ahimelech was the high priest when David visited the house of God, and he ate the showbread. So, it was the son who actually was the high priest. But his more famous father, Abiathar, was the more well-known high priest of that time. And that's reaffirmed in 1 Samuel itself when you read it, because it says that Doeg was actually about to kill, come and kill all the, high, all the priests except for Abiathar, who was able to flee to David. So 
He was the only one that ended up living. He's the one who stood out. So his name was more well-known as the one who was the high priest in that time period, even though his son was actually the high priest at that time. This is just one way of explaining how these things are not contradictory. So we can say that it would have been natural and accepted way of talking for Jesus to place David's visit to the house of God in the time of Abiathar. He was still alive. We know he was still alive at the time. So even though he wasn't the high priest anymore, we know he was still alive, and we know he was the more famous high priest. So it was just an easy way of referencing during the time of Abiathar, the high priest, even though now his son was the one reigning and doing that. And sometimes this even happened with the Herods. I mean, you read the book of Acts, there's so many Herods, it's hard to keep track of. Some are father and son, some are nephews, some are cousins and all that. Well, because some people get the recognition or even talking about the high priest in the time of Jesus, who in the, cru- in the uh, trial of Jesus, who was actually the high priest? Well, you can't only be high priest for so long. And so they had their sons do it, but they're actually the ones pulling the strings behind the scene. In the same way, the Bible is just referencing how people would have talked about that time period. It's not trying to contradict Samuel. It's just explaining how people would have understood it. Or in the case of Judas, in the case of Judas, well, which is it? Let's just look at it for a second so you can, you can feel the weight of this. this is the, I, I didn't know this one until I saw it. So just let's look at it together, right? Look at Matthew 27. We have just a minute to look at this. It's helpful when you see it in the Bible yourself. Matthew 27, verse 5. We know that Judas uh, had regret. We don't think he actually repented, but he regretted what he did. So it says in Matthew 27, 5, and throwing down the piece of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. So all Matthew says is that Judas hanged himself. All right, keep your finger there and then go over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter one. Again, different biblical author. He's writing for his audience, from his knowledge and experience. And it says in Acts 1, verse 18, it says, Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. It's talking about Judas. Um, and it says, He fell, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out that so matthew says he himself luke says in the book of acts that he's fell headlong and his innards his guts spilled out well we don't have to see this as a contradiction i think the easiest way to explain it is they're both true he did hang himself and i don't know if the branch broke or the rope broke or eventually he fell down and when he fell he fell hard and far and his innards spilled out. They're both true. One is not contradicting the other. They're just providing either the first bit of the story or the second bit of the story. And they can be easily reconciled by recognizing that they can both be true. In fact, they actually complement each other because they explain one explains the other. The reason his innards, you don't, you don't just fall, like you don't just trip and your innards fall out. You must be pretty high up. So he's hanging himself and then he falls, and his innards fall out. So they actually fit together. They actually fit together. Again, there's alleged contradiction in the Bible is brought up, but there's always a plausible explanation because the Bible is God's word, and God's word is true. And so when you run into these kinds of issues or someone brings them to you, you, don't, you can be tempted to be nervous and like, I don't know what to say. Well, first of all, just dig into the scriptures. Read them more carefully and try to find a way that they don't have to contradict. They're bringing the assumption that they must contradict. We're bringing the assumption that actually they don't contradict and we can explain how they don't have to contradict. There's no necessary contradiction. And you can look up resources like our Resolving Bible Difficulties course or the book we use for that, the Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, has all kinds of helpful information on these kinds of problems. And there's great Christian scholars have put things like this on websites, and you can read about it, and you can always come ask your pastors. The point is this. When you're faced with claims and questions that challenge the truthfulness of the Bible, that challenge the inerrancy of Scripture, and go to particular examples, like the ones we looked at today, 
the temptation can be to fear or shy away or not want to engage people. And what I'm trying to say from the very first thing I said is not be shy about engaging people because, like we said last week, what people need to see most of all is they need to actually read the Word of God. Most unbelievers have not actually seriously read the Bible. We don't, you defend the Bible like you defend a lion. You just open the cage, Spurgeon said. So bring people to the Bible. Let them f- see the truthfulness. Let them experience the Spirit's power as his revealed word opens up. And God, by his grace, can remove their darkened eyes and allow them to see that the Bible is God's word. And it is true. Bart Ehrman and those like him, they did not want to believe the Bible. I know what he claims, but we know what the Bible tells us. He was looking for a reason to walk away from his faith. Because he even said, in the the video clip we watched last week, this wasn't actually what led him away from the faith. What led him away from the faith is he didn't think God acted the way he should have acted. And so he went to undermine the Bible. So don't let people use excuses to explain away their sin by pointing to alleged errors in the Bible. People don't want to believe the Bible because it exposes their sinful hearts. It says the way they're living their life is wrong. It says they're not allowed to sleep with their girlfriend. It says they're not allowed to be sinfully angry. It says they have to honor their parents. It tells them they have to actually love even their enemies. They don't want to do that. They'd rather just hate their enemies. That's why they don't want to believe the Bible. And they use these alleged errors to excuse away their sinful and moral behavior. And so you don't need to be as shy about that or run from that. In fact, you can allow them just to see the word of God. Yes, answer their challenges to the best of your ability. Find the answers for yourself and for them, and then really confront them with the truthfulness of the Bible and help them to see that Jesus Christ is the one they need to reckon with, because he's the one who's going to judge them. They can point to all kinds of errors, but when he comes back, he's going to judge the living and the dead. It's appointed that a man wants to die, and then comes the judgment, and they have to give an account for that. And if they want to stand before Jesus and say, well, there's a bunch of errors in your Bible. That's why I didn't believe it. You can try that out, but it's not going to work. So why don't you reckon with it right now and repent of your sin and trust in Christ? Well, next week, next week, we will continue going through all these. And we will uh, talk about the question of why trust the Bible when the Bible is full of myths? In this case, we're going to look at the historicity of the Bible. This might be something you might be not as familiar with as some of these other ones. A lot of people point to a lot of things in the Bible and say there's a lot of parallels to these stories in ancient literature, in the ancient Near East. And really, the Bible is just like one of these other pagan myths in in the Old Testament, and it's just copying them. There's nothing unique about the Bible. The Bible is not unique. It's just like all these other ancient religions. And so it's just full of myths. There's nothing historical about the Bible. So what do we say about that? What are the claims and how do we respond? Hope you come back next week. Next week, I will not be teaching the lesson, but Pastor Austin will be teaching the lesson. And we already put the lesson together and it'll be really good. So make sure you come back. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray for your people in this room not to be intimidated by challenges to the Bible, but they be strengthened as they see how over and over again, over 2,000 years, the Bible has been a subject to attack and it keeps proving itself true because it's your word. If critics have not taken down the Bible over the last several thousand years, they're not going to find some new argument today. We can find confidence in your word because your word is true and because you are true. I pray, God, that we would be spurred on to want to engage unbelievers with the truth of the Bible because it's the only thing that actually explains their deepest problem, their sin and the solution only found in Jesus Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.